to protect you with the, uh, and come up with these stress test results? I, that's good. I think that is exactly what it is. I think he put out a rook. I think this is a big, good big play he made yesterday. And it's, it's pushback to the bankers saying, you want to talk profits and losses and taxes? I can talk that. And, and so he's putting in front of the public, consistent with his campaign, um, a point that, that, the, that the big dogs don't want to talk about, which is that they evade their taxes by moving their, quote, headquarters to the Grand Cayman Islands, and they, and they move to other offshore places, and then they pretend to be uh, holding their, tax, their taxes due in some offshore pollution. Someday they'll bring it back to the United States and be taxed, but not now, right? That would interfere with their, with their profits. I mean, this is a, this is a I think, f a really fundamental initiative because it leads to, eventually, a, a general reform of the corporate income tax, and, and that has, can have deep impact on trade. What happens in this country, unlike most other advanced economies, is the government for 30 years has said, whatever is good for the U.S. multinationals will ultimately be good for everyone in America. And therefore, that's our national interest, to advance these firms. Obama is offering a different analysis now, saying, wait a minute, these guys aren't paying any taxes. They're moving jobs offshore. How can that be good for the America? And that's the, that's the beginning, just the beginning, of a really profound debate, which no other president has had the nerve to, to initiate. I'd like to ask you about the role of the Federal Reserve Bank. You've said that one of the key uh, moves that needs to be made is the democratization of the Federal Reserve yeah, Bank. Yeah. Uh, who does the Federal Reserve Bank work for? Is it a central bank of the American people, or is it a... a, uh, a uh, uh, a vehicle for the bankers themselves? It's a little of both. It, it is a central bank. And there's a, I know there's a lot of argument that people uh, make about whether the Fed is public or private. But believe me, trust me, I wrote a long book about the Fed 20 years ago. It, it's, it's, a, it's an arm of government. It is cloistered in a, what I regard as an illegitimate way, literally protected from political accountability by the way it was set up. And that was supposed to keep the unruly masses from pushing it around and getting inflation and doing bad things like low interest rates and easy credit. But the truth is, it has always, from the beginning in 1913, been very close to these same folks, the largest, most influential, most powerful financial institutions. And it's, uh, it's I say, a, a central culprit alongside those private institutions in causing our present disaster. And it's a long story of how it did that, but, but to put it crudely, instead of being a balance wheel that serves labor and capital more or less in moderation on both sides, it tipped the balance of policy hard in favor of capital and against labor. It literally suppressed wages while it cut loose regulation and allowed these firms to do all of the so-called modernization, which have led to this disaster. So if we have a, a genuine new politics, and it's not clear yet whether we will or not, but if we do, I think at the top of the agenda should be a, a deep, critical look at the nature of the Federal Reserve, how it functions, who it works for, who it ignores, and, and a deep reform of that institution. Timothy Geithner came at it. Well, he was head of the New York Federal Reserve. Oh, explain uh, that, the significance of that and where he is today and the kind of policies he's formulating. Well, I saw one of your New York newspapers the other day called him the, the Wall Street poodle or something really <laughs> nasty, which I think is not, not inaccurate. I mean, he, he was, he was at, at, at the New York Fed, um, perfectly earnest and bright and all those good things. But he never took on these big banks when he saw, and in fact publicly worried now and then about derivatives and all these other excesses. Um, but he never used his power as a regulator to call him in and say, look, we've got to clean up this mess before it explodes on us. Then after it does explode and we lose Bear Stearns and Lehman and a bunch of others, 
he is he has been in the room every time these deals were made which is we'll take fed money treasury money we'll give you we'll finance your 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 losses and and keep you whole and that's his mentality i'm 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 sort of tried to hold off making it a personal critique but it's unavoidable his his view is and i fear it's now shared by the president that we will spend the public money to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. That's literally what they're doing. It sounds corny, but it's true. And, and um, first of all, that's wrong. But secondly, they will fail. Bill Greider, what does this mean for organized labor? I mean, GM, Chrysler, EFCA, uh, the Employee for, um, uh, Free Choice Act. Uh, I don't think we know the answer yet on the, on the Employees for Free Choice Act. I, mean, I know. I know the situation. Um, it, let me put it this way. The Democratic Party, after many years, and I'm a Democrat, I voted for Obama, I, I, I share those broad values and very broadly, but they've, they've had it both ways for 25 years or more, where they serve the financial interests and the big insurance companies and some other players, and at the same time, they're the party of working people. And that didn't work very well for working people. And they, and, but, but the Democrats always had an excuse, well, we don't have the votes, or we've got this terrible Republican president in who won't let us do good things for the folks. All those excuses are gone now. And we are seeing, for the first time, really in three decades, the true nature of the Democratic Party. And it's being tested, and so far, not doing very well. I won't say it's failed. But, but I think there's a real possibility that it will. The labor legislation is a good example. It's actually, I've been around the issues of labor organizing and unions and what was happening to them over the last three decades. They were getting hammered by economic forces, by companies that broke every law in, in the land to keep them from organizing, firing the organizers, firing the workers who signed up. They really play vicious, hardball, uh, labor suppression and got away with it. The government never stepped in and, and stopped it. So now labor wants a fairly modest bill, actually, to reform the processes of, of, of people organizing their own representatives. Sounds like democracy, doesn't it? And, and the same forces are burying the politicians in propaganda and, and trying to convince the public this is a bad idea. And we're seeing the the Democratic Party, which now has virtually 60 votes in the Senate and a strong majority in the House, sort of saying, well, we don't know if we can do this this year. Um, I think uh, I'm going to speak to the steelworkers in Pittsburgh uh, tomorrow. And this, I've told other labor groups this. This is also the time for labor to stand up. And it has, it has to get much more explicit and dry-eyed with the Democratic Party and saying, we've been there for you year after year with our votes, with our money, with our, with our hearts and minds. When are, if you're not going to deliver now, when are you going to deliver? 